Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, I will talk about this. Not the screen itself, that's not too interesting. But what's rather what's on the back. You might not see it that well because of the daylight, but there is some light glowing all around the TV. And you see it a bit better under a black reflection, which is here. And what you see is that on the back of the screen, I've put some LEDs, which are glowing right now. And I wanted to do the same thing as Philips already marketed quite some years ago under the name Ambient Lighting or Ambilight and the Thousands clone, which are called Atmolite and so on. So the idea is that you take the color of the screen and you put some ambient light in the, in the sides to have some background or some light atmosphere. And for now it's just um, glowing, but it can also work with some whatever is displayed actually. So if I start the movie, all around the colors which are displayed correspond to what's on the movie. And you can see it here. The colors are changing all the time depending on what's displayed on the screen. Let me go a bit faster. You can see I'm going forward in the movie and you see all the light are changing. So we'll talk about what I call the Q Voodoo screen light. We'll talk about these LEDs, which are individually controllable, as you can see it. We'll talk about the microcontroller, which controls these LEDs, but also about the protocol for the computer to send whatever must be displayed on the LEDs, and the software, which can render, which can interpret what's displayed on the screen and send it to, to the light controller. So almost two years ago, I participated in a Kickstarter crowdfunding campaign for the Blinky Tape. And these are the remainings of the Blinky Tape. The Blinky Tape is pretty simple. It's an LED strip with 60 LEDs. These are RGB LEDs and they are individually controllable, although they are on one strip. So this is quite nice. I've cut them because they're individually controllable and you can just splice the LED strip as, as you want them so you can control each individual LED and here we have six segments but it's in the beginning it was just one LED strip with 60 LEDs came also with a protective case for to protect it against water and a microcontroller board which you can see here I've disassembled it because it doesn't work anymore no, I founded this campaign, I got the blinky tape that was quite successful and then I had no idea what to use it for. It was shining, that was good, it was working quite well, but I didn't know what I could do with it. And now it's the time, I finally, I'm finally using it for the ambient light. I tried to use it once before, actually I did use it once before during one of my demos and I broke the board because I connected this controller board to two different circuits with two different grounds and none of them were floating. And at one point when I was driving one of the pins, I it got warm and then the microcontroller stopped working. I think, I'm not sure if I synced or I sourced too much power, but the, the pin died and the microcontroller with it. So this is the Plinky tape. It's basically just a uh, very thin circuit board just made of copper with silk screen with three different tracers and then we have these LEDs on top of it. These are VS2812B LEDs. They're quite nice because they are RGB LEDs and you just need to power them using plus 5 volt and ground and then to control them individually you have this data signal. And as you can see here, yeah, we have the 5 volt ground, data in, and then data out. So data comes in, is shifted in, so you shift the bits in, and whatever, and once the color is set for here, if you shift even more bits in, it will continue shifting it to the next LED. And this is how you can chain these LEDs, and just with one data line, which is on top, you can control almost as many LEDs as you want. 
because they are shifting the data all the time. And this is why also you can cut them at any point. Here we have some, some traces. Um, and you can reassemble them as you wish. I've already cut mine from the 60 LEDs. If we look closer, here. Here we see there's everything inside it. It only requires 5 volt and the data line, and then we can see the three LEDs, red, green, blue. These are the three LEDs here. And here we have the microcontroller which is driving it. So it's it's using PVM to to increase and decrease the brightness of each individual LED. And you just have to send eight bit values for each of the LEDs. So in whole you shift 24 bit values inside. It will set the color for this one and whatever is coming more, more than this 24 bits will just be shifted out using this microcontroller and this microcontroller will drive um, will drive this LED. So these are quite nice LEDs. And this is the board which came with it. This is the blinky tape co controller to control the LEDs. So on the left side you had here a micro USB connector so you could connect your LED strip to, to USB. Here was the microcontroller on top of it. This was an Atmel Atmega 32U4 I think some test points, some passives, and then we have the three connections. We have the ground connection, the 5 volt connection, and the data connection, which was then simply soldered to the tape. On the back, we see we have a bit more pins, and the error I did is that I used this ground pin and this D11 pin, but on a circuit which had a different ground. And when, when I was setting this pin, it was getting a bit too warm and then it, the microcontroller just broke and we can see it here actually. Up. Here, so this was the original microcontroller at Mega 32U4 exactly. And here we can see this hole. Well, there is one of the pins which I synced all source a bit too much power in or out and it, it just broke. And because this is the FN package, so it's with a huge error, it's a bit kind of a pain to to change and resolder. So I decided just to dismount it and use the LED strip which whatever other microcontroller I wanted because well it simply needs one line of data. It can't be that complicated to implement the code to for this microcontroller. So I just got rid of this simple microcontroller and I didn't replace the chip on it. Let's have a look at the WS2928 12B LED datasheet from World Semi. As you can see from the quality or the presentation of the datasheet, you will recognize that this is a cheap Chinese product. But well, the datasheet is at least there. So this is an RGB LED, three colors per LED, with chip integrated. So you just send the data in, uh, inside it. And it comes in a 50-50 package. 50-50 stands for 5 mm times 5 mm. Um, each LED has a brightness of uh, two different, has 256 different brightness levels. And this is because this is the value from one bit. So when you send one bit, you can change the brightness of each color. And these are all the colors. If you have 256 times three, this is the colors you can reach. And I think they're using PVM modulation, a pulse width modulation, to change the brightness since it talks about a scan frequency of 400 hertz per second. Um, you can cascade the LEDs or daisy chain them as you might want to call them. It, uh, the refresh rate of 50 FPS is possible if you cascade to 1024 points. So this is quite good. And the data rate is 800 kilobits per second. This is the most important characteristics you will have to know about this LED. Um, let's look at the LED package itself. As you can see, it's five millimeters by five millimeters, so 50-50, and this is how the LED comes in. So here you have uh, power, five volts preferably. The, the pins are just described here. Here you have power, which is five volts. Here you have ground. This is the data coming in, and since you can chain them, cascade them, daisy chain them, you can do data will be followed in, in data out. So this is incoming data, this is outcoming data, and then you would just have to 
put a new LED here with the incoming data being the one from the outcoming data. These are the pins and these are the characteristics, so VDD should be around 5 volts. Um, no more characteristics about the electrical things and here we have the data timers but first let's have a look at the protocol. So the protocol is just one data line. You send everything in one data. If you want to send a zero bit this is the format you have to use. You have to be high with the rising edge for around for T0H so T0 high, timer 0 high or time 0 high and then low for time 0 low. Same for the um, for the one code, if you want to want to send a one bit T0 high, which is longer than T0, no, T1 high, which is longer than T0 high, and then T1 low, which is shorter than T0 low. And in the end, you have the read code. I think this, this is the reset code. You have to stay f low for a certain time, so all the data gets applied. And these are the values which we see here, the timing values. So you will see that if you add T0 high and T0 low, so 400 microseconds and 850 microseconds, it corresponds to uh, 1.28 microseconds plus minus 300 microseconds, so 128 microseconds, and this is where the 800 kilobits per second comes from, from this 800, 1.28 microseconds per bit. Same for T1, T1 high and T1 low, it's 8, 0.8 and 0 0.45, it adds up to 1.25 microseconds. And the reset code or the reset signal is 50 microseconds. So if you don't send any data for 50 microseconds and keep it low, it will know this is the reset and it will apply the colors which you sent previously. And this is how it is sent. So here, this is how you cascade it. You have T1 cascade. The in, you're sending data in D1 and D1 will send data into D2 and so on. So if you s this is how you send the data. First you send the 24 bits for the first LED. The first LED will take this 24 bits and whatever you send after the 24 bits will be shifted out to the second LED. So the second LED will see this message. The first 24 are kept by the first LED and the second 24 are sent to the second LED and, and so on. So the second LED will take the 24 bits and whatever comes afterwards, so here, will be sent to the third LED and the third LED will take the 24 bits. And if you stop for at least 50 microseconds, it will know, okay, the value which I got, I have to apply it now to my LED colors. And you can send new LED colors afterwards. That's basically the, the protocol, it's pretty simple. And how you send the, the bits is not red, green, blue, as you are used to be for RGB LEDs. You start with the most significant bits of the green color, up to the least significant of the green color, and then comes red, then in the end, oh here, red, and then in the end, blue. So it is green, red, blue, not red, green, blue. This is just a diagram how to Cascade it preferably and this is the end of the data sheet. It's only five pages long, but there is all the information you need out of it. The most in important information is this that we now have. So we know that for s every single bit you we need to have to go high, stay high, go low and then go high at the end again. And this needs to happen in 1.28 microseconds. To drive the LED, I will use an Atmega 328P microcontroller. This is simply because it's a very simple microcontroller, which I'm familiar with. Um, it comes with very cheap development boards and um, it should be enough to send to control this, these LEDs. Now, about this microcontroller, you see here that it's up to 20 million instructions per cycle, per second, sorry, uh, at a throughput of 20 megahertz. This is if you use the 20 megahertz crystal clock along with, for this microcontroller, uh, and it's the maximum. Now, I, on my development board, I only have 16 megahertz. So I will only have up to 16 million instructions per second and up to 
tells you that one instruction, some instruction need only one cycle and some other instruction need a bit more cycles. Now if we remember right from the VS WS2812B LED data sheet, each bit, uh, the baud rate was 100 kilobits per second. That was the baud rate, simply because every bit has to be sent in uh, 1.25 microseconds. Now if you think about this microcontroller, 16 megahertz, that corresponds to a cycle of period of um, 62.5 nanoseconds. Now 62.5 nanoseconds, you have at maximum one instruction in 62.5 nanoseconds. And in 1.25 microseconds, you have exactly 20 times 62.5 nanoseconds. 62.5 nanoseconds, so you have 20 cycles to send one bit for one bit. 20 cycles is not a lot. Even if it's quite fast, the boat rate here is, is also fast. So <coughs> with my microcontroller, I in the beginning thought I would use timers to match this this sort of specific waveform and just send ones and zero depending uh, on the timer. And with interrupt service routines, timers are quite fast. The problem is that interrupt service routine needs some time to go up. You have to save the registers before going to the inverse service routine, go to the interrupt service routine, initialize the function, and so on. So, and since you need to do it multiple times, it is pretty hard to respect these 20 cycles for every bit knowing that you need to s to know if it's a zero or a one and then depending on that you need to adjust the timer. Um, in C it's pretty hard also to respect the timing because the compiler will optimize it such a way that you it's it's hard to, to have something something which is really precise <coughs> and to know what it's really doing. Um, but in the end I can do it in, in assembly so what I have to implement is very simple. This is the waveform. At the beginning, so this takes 1.25 microseconds or 20 cycles. <coughs> now in 20 cycles, I need to be up, go low and be up again. And this, the, this going low depends if you want to send a zero or a one. If you want to send a zero, you have to go low uh, after 0 .4, or 0 0.4 microseconds. If you want to send a 1, you have to go there at after 0 0.8 microseconds, so double of the time. And for that you have 20 cycles. So if this is cycle 0, this will be at cycle 6, around cycle 6, and this will be at cycle 13, and this is cycle 20. So we have 20 cycles and no matter what happens at cycle 13, we have to be low, so we can set it low. And at cycle 6, we have to decide if it's a zero, then I want to go low now, else I will stay a bit longer, high, and then put a low afterwards. So that depends on the bits which you want to read. And we will have a look at the implementation. And I had to implement it in the assembly because this is very temp critical and since we only have 20 microseconds, I want to be sure that this happens at this clock cycle and not at the next clock cycles because this timing needs to be precise. I think for every bit you have 150 microseconds um, oh, 150 microseconds slack time, that's only two cycles. So we have to really be pre pre pretty precise and we will look at my implementation now. So let's go through my implementation for controlling the LEDs. Yes, there are probably already thousands of libraries which have exist which control these LEDs, but I wanted to implement it myself um, because I wanted to learn how it works. And it's been a while since I've done inline assembly. And as we said, as I said before, every bit needs to be sent in 1.25 microseconds. That's what these LED expect. With our 20, 16 megahertz development board, 
one cycle takes 62.5 nanoseconds, meaning that for every bit, 1.5 microseconds, we have 20 clock cycles. And we have to do this in, in these 20 clock cycles in these 20 clock cycles. Since in C it's not very reliable timing wise and the timing is quite strict and with interrupts we won't be fast enough, I've decided to use inline assembly and it's been a while since I've wrote inline assembly but it wasn't too hard. I mean you have at maximum 20 instructions. Now this is how it looks like in clock cycle. These are 20 clock cycles. In the beginning, the signal on the output pin for the data line for the LEDs is high. And it is high for at least six clock cycles. After the six clock cycle, if the bit which we need to send is a zero, it will go low. If it's a one, it will only go low at the 13th clock cycle, which you see here. So no matter what happens after the 13th clock cycle, it will the output pin will be low. And this is depending on if it's high or not. So how I implemented it is that I put it too high in the beginning. If it's a zero, I set it too low at this clock cycle. And if it's a one, I do nothing. And what, no matter what happens in the end, I will set it too low at this clock cycle. So if it would be a one, it will go low here because it hasn't been set too low just previously. Um, all the codes, so this is just a comment again, but all the code which I will present here will be available in the Git repository and you can download it and use it by yourself. Um, the variables which I'll use are following. Here we have a count which counts the number of, of bits we need to send. So every time we send a bit we will increment it and after all the bits are gone, actually we will decrement it and after all the bits are gone we just stop with it. You set the number of LEDs which you have in the header in this define variable. And since per LEDs we need to send three bytes, red, green and blue values, we have 24 bits. This is why we have this 24 times 24. This is the count and every after every time we will send a bit, we will decrement it and once it's a zero, we finished sending out the data. This high and these high and low values are the values to be set for the pin. As we've seen in the beginning, we want it to be high and in the end we want it to be low. This is what it is for. So it is since we only want to control one pin because there is only one data line required by the LED, we want um, I'm using this port. In this case, this is again a define on port D. And on port D, I have a mask telling which bit I want to use, corresponding to which pin. Here I've used the pin PD2. So this mask corresponds to the bit number two, if we start with zero, will be at one. This is the mask corresponding to this port. And this is why it will only this pin will be high and the other one will be as it was before. Same thing for low. I take the value which is already on the port and then I ensure that the pin used for the LED, PD2 in my case, will be will stay low. Um, here we have the array of colors which we want to send. And how I saved it is that I have every byte encodes, every byte in this array encodes one bit to be sent to the LEDs. It's quite a waste of memory, but I'll see. We'll see later on why I did that. So every time I send an LED, I will just read out a byte. So I will, and if I go to the next bit for this LED, I will decrement one. I will decrement the count, and I will go to the next bit. And this is already what we see here. I'm reading the value, and I'm going to the next byte where the bit is stored. And this will be the output value. The output value is per default low. And then I add whatever is in whatever I want to send. And this is already corresponding to this mask. If we've set all the color bits before, this is another function. You just pass the RGB values and it will create 
uh, corresponding to the mask what bits has to be sent on the output port. This is what we see here. Uh, the reset code we'll see a bit later on, but we want to assure that at least 50 microseconds have passed before we send another burst of colors. And here we have the inline assembly. As you can see, it is not a lot, actually. It holds in, in a few lines. Um, here we see all the time the start of the cycle, how many cycles the current assembly instruction takes and the end clock cycle. And we can see that we start at zero. So this is just preparing something. We start at zero and we finish at 19. Since we started, no, we start at minus one and we finish at 19. So this makes 20 clock cycles. And that's exactly what we want. Also, because it is very time critical, we don't want the microcontroller to interrupt or our, our code. This is why we are disabling the interrupts and because we don't want the compiler to optimize this, here we see we have a lot of knobs. So normally the compiler would remove these knobs to save clock cycles. Um, because we don't want that, we have to put that this is assembly and this is volatile assembly. So do not optimize this stuff and leave the knobs as they are because they keep track of the timing and that will arrange that uh, the bits are sent exactly at the right time. As I explained before, um, first we go, we have high, then we just have to read the value and set the bit. Um, if it's a zero, we set it here. And then we set zero, you know what, uh, what happens. So this is clock cycle number zero. And this is what we see here in the beginning, I output on the current port the high value. So I ensure that at the beginning of every bit transmission it will be high. Afterwards I decrement the count because I will go to the next count and I have enough time to do here. Now this is the important part. If this count is equal to zero we will stop the transmission uh, and we we branch equal to zero depending on the decrement here if it's zero it will go to one f so one actually uh, f stands for forward and one corresponds to this level and as we can see it's the end of the assembly so once we've gone through all ids we stop doing everything um, now we have to prepare the next value which we will output so we have already read out and we are just ordering it with the low value, which we've saw already here. So it's not, for, for this clock cycle, it's not important, but for the next one, once we know load the next values, we have to do the exact same thing. We have to or it. Um, and this is what we, what we do here. Simply we load, uh, in, out will be the value which is loaded from here. Here we will or it with low, so we have exactly what we need to output. And this is what we are doing here. At the end of clock cycle 6, the uh, we will have output, the output value to the port. And if it's uh, 0, it will ensure that it will be low because we or it too low. If it's a 1, it will still stay high. Afterwards, we have lots of time. So what I simply do is I load the next value. The next value, this is the pointer to the color. I just increment the pointer and read it out into out. And this is what we'll use afterwards to or it with low and then to output it. And we have lots of idling time. We could do other things, but here we do simply do nothing. And the last part is clock cycles number 13. In number 13 we have to set it low no matter what happens. So if here it has been set to low because it was a high pin, it was a 1, we will ensure that no matter what happens it will be set to low here. So we output to, we output to the port the low value. And then we just wait until the um, transmission is, is ended and we go back to the beginning. This is what you see here 
we jump back to zero, which is before. This is the label number zero and we start again. And we continue on and on until the count is at zero. And if the count is at zero, it will branch here, which is the end of the transmission. And here we see all the values count is count as we've seen out is out port is the port which we've defined and the next correspond to um, all of them once this this is done we can enable interrupts again and this is where the reset code starts so here reset I set the reset code to zero and i used timer number zero to wait at least 50 milliseconds here there's an interrupt request and if timer number if 50 milliseconds pass, timer number zero will uh, trigger and this will reset, set the reset code to true. And once the reset code is to true, we can start resetting again. Else, oh, standing out the bits again. Else we would wait forever in this loop until the timer of 50 microseconds has passed. And that's all actually. And as you can see, it is very, very simple. Now, I waste a lot of things with knobs, but it's not too important. But what's more important is that I waste a lot of bits and a lot of memory because just to send one bit, I have to store it in one byte. There's an advantage to this is that actually I don't have to use only one bit. I could connect all the LEDs in parallel on the different pins of this port. I could use all the eight pins of this port. And what I can do is control the LEDs in parallel. So whenever I set the data in the color bits, I say that for this bit, for this, this is the bit stream for this bit, but on another bit, I have another bit stream for another pin and for another LED strip. So in the end, if I use up to eight LED strips, which are connected to the different pins, I don't waste any memory because I will use all the eight bits valuable per byte. And yeah, this is this is my, optimi uh, my optimization. And again, even if I use eight LED strips, I drive them completely in parallel. So the code is exactly the same. I don't pass more time um, outputting data for eight LED strips simply because they are in parallel. And also, I don't waste any memory if I use all the eight. I, if it's one or eight LED strips, it will be the exact amount of memory. And it's good enough. So what I simply do is to restrict the memory, I cut my LED tape into smaller segments and then I just drive them in parallel. It has two advantages. Um, I, I save some memory and then outputting the data is quite fast since Instead of driving 60 LEDs um, and shifting out the 20, 24 bits per LED for 60 LEDs, I will divide it by six. So I will have to send 10 LED colors, 10, 20, 10 times 24 bits, so 240 bits. And this takes a lot less time than sending it for 60 LEDs. Yeah, so that's it. Um, the rest of the code will also be available. Um, for controlling the LEDs and so on. So look at the GitHub repository if you want to have it. The Blinky Tape LED controller is gone. I've burnt the microcontroller. But well, I wanted to implement myself the protocol to control these VS2812 LEDs. And for that, I used developed code for this microcontroller. This is an Atmel Atmega 328P. And it is well known and quite common because it's the microcontroller used for the Arduino development board. And as you can see here, I also use the Arduino development board out of convenience. It also comes with the clock I require, 16 megahertz. The code we've designed and we've reviewed is designed for 16 megahertz. So you will need a chip from this family and uh, you need to be clocked as 16 megahertz. Um, I use port D of the microcontroller to, con to shift out the data for the VS2812 BLEDs. This is what corresponds to port D. The two first ones are used for UART, so I don't use them. And then PD2, I use them to, to shift out the data for these strip LEDs. This is why I also connected the oscilloscope probe here, so we can have a look at the signal which is output by, by our code. I also connected the second 
probe of the oscilloscope to this pin, pin 13. This corresponds to PB5 on this microcontroller and this is also where the user LED is connected to here. And whenever before I shift out data to this pin for the VS2812 B LEDs, I will switch on or off this user LED and we will trigger on this signal here. So let me plug the thing in. So I'm not sure if you see it blinking or if you just, it's, it's quite fast, so probably you just see it very dim. And if we look at the oscilloscope, this is the signal we get. The yellow one is channel one, this is the user LED. The blue one is channel two, this is the VS2812 B LED. And as you can see, I shift, I switch on and off the LED, user LED, and then I shift out the data for the VS2812 LED. 28, 12 LED. And we can have a look at the signal to see if I'm respecting the timing. Let's have a signal shot capture. <clears throat> and let's see what is going out. So what I'm shifting out is four times zero and four times one. This is this why you see also the diff the two kinds of signal, the short burst and the longer burst. If you want to shift out a zero bit, you need to be to have the signal up for 0 0.4 microseconds. This is 400 nanoseconds. And then you need to be low for 850 nanoseconds. And as we can see here, this is almost what I co uh, what's corresponding. Instead of 400 nanoseconds, I have 370 nanoseconds for the up signal. And for the low signal, instead of 800 50 nanoseconds, I have 880. It is quite close. And for the on data, you need to be on for 800, I think 800, yeah, 800 nanoseconds, and then off for 450 nanoseconds. And we can see here that I'm on for 880 nanoseconds. This is uh, um, a bit longer, and then I'm off for 317 nanoseconds. But since all this signal are plus minus 150 nanoseconds, I'm within the margin. So the data which is coming out should be, should be all right, actually. And we can test it directly by, instead of connecting the oscilloscope, we can connect the LED strip. So here, um, if you look at the data, I'm outputting 24 bits. So we see 24 on off. And this corresponds to the three colors for one LED, RGB. Um, each color uses eight bits, so eight, four, eight times three is 24. So we have the 24 pulses coming out. Now I just need to connect this LED to the board and we can see what is going out. So we have ground. Plus, no, this is grown actually. This is five volts. This is the data coming in, going out. And let's have a look at the LED. It should switch on. Up. Here it switches on. And as you can see, it is a uh, dim white because I'm outputting zero F for all three colors, red, green, and blue. Although it's not red, green, and blue. The order is a bit different here. but. It works, our implementation works. I can control one LED. What I can also do now is, as you see on the oscilloscope, increment the RGB values. And as you can see here, we have a fading white, which is going from zero to um, 255. And this is the fading which we see. So that works quite nice for one LED. We can control it pretty well. Now we can also control two LEDs since um, the data it's just shifted across the LEDs. So instead of having 24 bits shifted out, we have 48 bits, 24 for the first and 24 for the second one, which you see here. So it takes a bit longer. And as we can see, we have two LEDs which are fading. And you just need double the time because it's two LEDs and this is linearly proportional to the number of LEDs. 
But what I can also do is control two LED strips in parallel. And as you can see here, it doesn't come with any cost in time for transmitting the LED signal. We still have 48 bits and this is because the I control, I send out data to the whole port D which is here. So I could drive it up to eight LED strips and then as many LEDs as I want on a strip and the eight LED strips will be in parallel with no costs whatsoever in time since it is parallel and in memory because I always used one byte. So wh whatever happens I will always set out data to this whole port D pin and as we can see we can control two LEDs. We can ch change the data also. Here we have just two different data, but each LED is settable individually. So with that, the code for controlling this VS2812B LEDs is complete and works quite nice. We can now also measure the time which I require for setting the color of one LED and um, displaying the color of one LED. And this is what you see in yellow. So when the uh, when yellow is on high, this is when I set the LED color, and for that I require around 34.4 microseconds, let's say 35 microseconds, and then when it's low, this is when I'm outputting the data. So this is pre-calculating and this is shifting out the data. And this requires around 49.2 20 microseconds and this is for a single LED. And now for 11 LEDs which you see here and which is the maximum which I will use, up we can see that setting the color requires 384 microseconds so this is simply 35 multiplied by um, 11 around that and then setting, sending out the data requires 320 332 microseconds and as we can see most of the signal is used to shift out the data. The pre-processing which we had in the beginning just doesn't take any much more time. This was constant and then this is linearly proportional to the number of LEDs. And we have to remind us of these numbers because this is what will limit our refresh rate. Now we verified our implementation for controlling the WS2812B LEDs and we did it using this board but this was just for the proof of concept. Now let's for the final product I will use this board. This is an Arduino Nano 3 clone. It's a lot smaller as you can see but it has the same processor on it. It's an 8 mega 328 P. Uh, it has the same number of LEDs, the, the components are the same, it's just that the USB is a mini USB. This is the 16 megahertz clock and it's a lot smaller. This is the UR to USB converter, this is the voltage regulator and as you can see that it's a lot smaller. So it will fit whatever I need. Um, I've connected here to this board and these pins here, the D0 to D8, corresponds to the D port. This is where we will control these LED strips with. And we have to remember that these LED strips, so per LED there are three LEDs, red, green and blue. Each one is around consumes at full brightness around 20 milliampers. So one LED can consume up to 60 milliampers. Now I have six strips and in total I have 60 LEDs. 60 times 60 milliampers is 3.4 amps. So that's quite a lot of power which this small microcontroller will not provide. This is why I've attached this small other board which will provide the current for driving all the 60 LEDs. And this is what you see here. Uh, here I connect the power, plus five external plus five volts to to drive the LEDs. Um, the black marking is just to say that this line is ground and this line is plus 5 volts. So, and this is to control the um, to control the LEDs, so to send the data out. So you can see we have bridges here. So I will control, I will connect the plus 5 volts of the LED strips on these pins, the ground on these pins, 
and the data line on these pins. And if I need to uh, to provide power to this microcontroller, I can also connect a plus five volt line here, uh, ground here, and I can either power this Arduino nano board or this microcontroller using the USB. This provides five volts and the serial, or I can do it this way. Here, the five volts, and here is the serial if I want to provide directly serial to it. So let's connect it and try if it works. And there we have it. So here we have the microcontroller. Here I've connected all the LED strips. So we have six LED strips for the six remaining pins. The two first pins are used for the UART serial communication, where we will transmit the data in. This black cable is the power cable to provide enough power for the LEDs, since this board cannot do it. And if I connect it to power and if I flash the device, connect to power. Yep. Here we have the LED strips connected. We have six strips, 11 lights, 8, 11, 11, 8, 11. And if I now flash the device and test the device, yep, now it's flashing, now it's testing. You see the moving LED dot to test if all LEDs are addressable and then there's a white glow going on and off. So we can control all the LEDs. The next thing is to synchronize it with the TV. So this is my screen. It's only a um, computer display screen, so it's not too large, it's not a TV. And this is good because the LED strips are quite narrow. This is also how I cut the LED strips. So the blinky tape has 60 LEDs, and I divided it up, up to six LED strips because Using my current code, I can control up to eight strips in parallel. But the problem is that on PD0 and PD1 pins of the microcontroller is the UART pin, so TX and RX, and I still want to send the data over UART, so I cannot use these pins. It means that the six other pins are remaining, and this is why I've cut the LED strips in six. And if you count the number of LED strip, the number of LEDs in total, you will come to 60 LEDs, and the blinky tapes comes with 60 LEDs. That's, that's, uh, but it, what is important is the number of LEDs per side. So on top, you have 19 LEDs, and on the side, you have 11 LEDs. And I chose that to aspect to correspond to the aspect ratio. Um, Full HD has an aspect ratio of 1.27. It's the same as uh, the 60 to 9 aspect ratio, uh, which has been kept. Now, if we count my 19 LEDs on the top divided by 11 LEDs on the side, we will come to an aspect ratio of 1.72. So it is very close to the aspect ratio of the screen. This way, I distribute the colors per LEDs as good as I can. And this is the result. I've taped the LED strips on the back of the TV and this is the glowing ambient light with it, which it produces, which is quite nice. Let's have a look at the back of the screen. Yep. Here. So here are the LEDs. This is the microcontroller and the LED strips are connected to it. And I'll explain why I have this arrangement. I have 11 LEDs here, 11 there, 8 here, 11 LEDs here, 11 LEDs here, and 8 LEDs here. And as you see, it works pretty nice. This is the power. This is the USB to control the what's what's being displayed on. And here is the power because it's quite power hungry. <laughs> and the only thing which is remaining now is sync the LEDs with what's displayed on the screen. Because for now it's just doing the test mode, meaning glowing, fading the white. But now we still need something which sends data out to the LEDs corresponding to what's displayed on the screen and preferably if you watch a video you want that to correspond to a video. So the first thing I found for 
when I looked for video and then um, Ambilight or Atmolite is VLC itself. And surprisingly, VLC, or not surprisingly because it's very popular, if you go in Tools, Preferences, Show All Settings, there is a video filter which is called Atmolite, which does exactly this. So it's the same idea as the Ambient Light from Philips, it's just called Atmolite because it's a simpler version and it's not branded Philips. And here you can set the device type, the serial port to connect to this Atmolite, and you just send out the data. And we'll have a look at what data actually VLC sends to this Atmolite device because our microcontroller needs to parse it and then set the LEDs. Uh, and, and we'll start with the classic Atmolite seal. It's called Atmolite filter. It makes sense to start with the classic Atmolite. It's a very simple one. This is the Atmolite message format. So Atmolite is the protocol which is used by, by VLC to send out data. And this is used by the Atmolite classic. And this is how the data looks like which is sent. It is very simple and pretty straightforward. You just have, it just main send out these RGB values, red, green, and blue, every time it's one byte, and you send this per channel. Uh, one channel could be one LED, but it could be several LEDs. That's why it's called a channel. Once you finish with the first channel, you send the red, green, and blue value for the second channel, and so on, and so on. Now to know how many channels there are, you have this length field. This will tell how many bytes are coming in this message. And because this would limit to 255 bytes and you need 3 bytes per channel, this limits you in the number of channels you have. They also thought about it in case you want to have a lot of LEDs or a lot of channels and they added this offset. So whenever you have more than 255, you will just increment the offset and this will tell that it's the next 255 coming up. Since these are two bytes, you can have a lot of LEDs or a lot of chunks at least. And just to make the, the parsing easier, all the messages start with FF. So you will FF, the offset, zero, 00 generally, then the number of bytes you will send. Then you just send the number of bytes, being the RGB values, and you can send the next Atmolite message. And per default, Atmolite comes with four, five channels at least. You have the color, so here we see, you see the five channels. You have the color on the, oops, let's put it red. You have the color on the center uh, of the screen, which is right here. Then you have the color on the left side of the screen, which is here. Then it sends out the color on the right side of the screen, then the color on the top side of the screen, which is here, and in the end, the color on the bottom side of the screen. Th this is why they're calling it channels and not LEDs, because on this side, you would want more than one LED. So you would have lots of LEDs which shine the, si the same color. This is what the Atmolite Classic is doing. The Atmolite Classic only has five channels, and generally you only have three LED strips. But at least it's a very simple format. And in this case, the messages will always start with zero because you have only 15 bytes which you need to send. Three times five channels. So three RGB values times channels. This is why this is always zero and this is why it's, this is always um, zero F for 15. So now it is time to test our Atmolite implementation to see if it works well. And for that we will use the Atmolite plugin for VLC. And we first have to configure it in Tools, Preferences, Show All Settings, and then you go down to Video Filters and you will see the Atmolite filter to configure the Atmolite video filter. Uh, we use the device type Classic Atmolite because this is the protocol we've implemented. This is the path to the serial port. They have TTY USB 0 because we connected over USB and this is the first serial port. Um, and then you can leave the rest per default. If you change or switch the order of the different channels, of the different sides, LED strips, you can change it here. So that's also important, but if everything has been done right, you can leave it per default. And now we can enable the plugin. For that, you go in Tools, Video and Effects. Then video effects, uh, effects and filters, I think, video effects, and then Atmolite. You can enable the Atmolite plugin just by 
clicking here. And you can even configure Atmolite for how fast it changes colors and so on. Um, so let's try out with some test patterns. For example, let's try with some red. Up. And if you can see, I'm not sure if you can see well because it's I'm shooting just in daylight, so there won't be a lot of light. But in the background, you can see some some glow, red glowing light. And if I switch to green, here's the green test pattern. You can also see it switching to green. Let's see at the back up of the TV how it looks like. And yeah, this is how it looks like. So here we have the green color. Now we can test the red color. And as you can see, it's all red. And let's have a bit the more complicated pattern, the RGB pattern. And this is the restriction with the, with the classic Atmolite. Classic Atmolite, or the simple Atmolite, has only four channels. Top, bottom, right, left. And this is what we see corresponding to the picture. On the left side, which is on the right side, on, on the front of the screen, we have some blue. This is what we see here. On the left side of the screen, so on the right side, we have some red. This corresponds. But on top and bottom, we have three colors. Red, green, blue. And we can see that VLC calculated that the more dominant color is probably red. And this is why we have red on top, on bottom, and not three colors. And this is a huge restriction for the classic Atmolite. You only have four colors for one per side. And this is okay if you want to have a simple device because you could have LED strips with three channels, red, green, and blue. And then whenever you switch the channels on the sides of the LED, all the LEDs will have the same color. So you just have to switch on and off the channels. And this is a very easy uh, way to do it. You just switch on and on, and you can even have pulse width modulation to change the brightness. And then you have four strips of RGB LEDs, and the whole strip will have the same color. Now, we have WS2812B LEDs, and these are ad singly, ad individually addressable. So we can set the RGB color of every single LED independently. So it's a waste of time. Oh, it's a waste of these LED strips if we will just use them to have the same color on the on the LED strip. And that's the limitation of the classic Atmolite plugin is just it just supports four sides. Um, but at least it works. And if we try some video, let me start some video. Here tears of steel. Up, open We can see that it starts. And the LEDs are fading, and it corresponds to the color. So here it's pretty white and dark, but now it's getting a faint of blue. And the refresh rate is quite okay. Up and if we see here, so the picture is pretty white. That's why the background is pretty white. But I think once we've changed. For example, here we have more reddish color. Here we have more reddish color. And if we look at the back, we will have more a reddish color too. So that works quite nice. We have now a very simple, but yet working Atmolite. Um, yeah, but the limitation is that it has only four different sides, and we will try to correct that or find some alternative. But VLC comes with other device types. So if you go into Tools, Preferences, so All Settings, video filters, and then Atmolite, you will see we chose that the classic Atmolite, the simple implementation with two LED strips only, but there are other ones. And for example, Nordlicht allows you to um, set even more channels. So this is, we will set the Nordlicht, the connection to the serial part 
path to receive a report is the same. We will keep that. And then you have the node initial options. But what's more important here is that in the built-in Atmo, you can change the number of zones. And this is, as we've seen, we've had one zone, so one color per side. This, these are the zones. We can change it, and we can say we want the maximum number of zones on the top. Sadly, this is only 16. Um, so we'll have the same on the bottom. To keep the aspect ratio 16 to 9, we will just put 9 on the side. So we have 16 to 9, and we will calculate an average. With 16 on top, 16 on bottom, and 9 on the sides, we have a total of 50 LEDs plus one average one, it's 51 LEDs. And actually, I just used the average one to trigger the coloring. So once all 50 LEDs are set, these 50 LEDs, it will send the average, and the average will trigger the display of the colors. Um, and this is the front that option, how many LEDs you want. You can have up to 254, I think, LEDs. Um, and the last thing we have to do is the channel zone assignment. So we've defined how many zones we want per side, and then we've set how many channels the um, Fnordlicht has, and now we have to set which channel corresponds to which zone. Um, I've prepared it already for my LED arrangement. Now we have, we have to set to tell VLC which zones should be sent elsewhere. And this is how my construction is. So this is from the front screen. On the top, we have 16 LEDs uh, because VLC cannot handle more than 16 LEDs uh, per side. So here we have 11 and five. And this is how I built the, uh, I've arranged the Atmo lights. So the first LED and for the first, so the first channel corresponds to this LED. This is the 10th channel, this is 11. 15 ch channel and so on. So this is the values which you see here. This is the LED number. And we have to tell VLC which zone corresponds to which LED. VLC works this way. Um, this is zone number zero and then it does clockwise. So when we send the data, we will first have, so since this is the first channel, we first have to tell LED that it should send first zone number five no, sorry, because, yeah, yeah, it is. So zone number five up to zone number 15. And then since this is the 14th LED, it will have to send zone number four for the uh, 11th channel and so on. Um, this is just to, to save you some time and to understand how VLC works when uh, you have this show channel zone assignment. And for example, this tells that for the first LED, it will send the zone number five. And how it works is this on the top left, this is zone number zero. Then it will go this way all around. Here we have 16 zones, so this will be zone number 15. From zero to 15, that's 16 zones. Then it goes down for nine zones, left for uh, 16 zones, and up again for nine zones. And this is the LED arrangement which, which I have here. So we'll save it and we can directly try it out with some pattern. Um, let's try again with the RGB pattern, the red pattern. Up. Here we have, you see the red glowing on the back. So that works quite nice. Let me get again. Oh, I meant the thing. So here you can see we had the red glowing. Let's try with green. Green works nice too. And here you see the restrictions. We only have 16 zones on the top. I have 19 LEDs max, but I can only use 16 of them. So three LEDs are wasted. And same on the side, I have 11 LEDs on the LED strip, but because of the aspect ratio, I only chose nine. So I only have nine LEDs which are used. And these two LEDs are, are just um, not used. This is the limitation of VLC. It doesn't allow you to have more than 16 LEDs sticks in zones per side. Uh, quite a shame, actually. But at least it works. And now if we have the more complex patterns, like the RGB pattern, we can see that it works. Um, 
we have, whoop, I've let it finished, let's start it again. We have the blue on the side, then in the middle we have green, and on the other side we have red. So that works pretty well, and we can even have a bit more complex patterns, like this pattern, where we have colors a bit everywhere, and here you can see that the colors match. Um, to to what's shown on the screen, and this we could already use uh, the potential of the LED strips with single addressable LEDs. And since this implementation works nice, let's try it again with a movie. Tears of Steel again. Switch it on. Now it is starting, and here we can see that the LEDs are dressed differently corresponding to the color. So this is very bright white, this is not less bright white, and then we will have some colors once we have colors in the movie. Um, the problem here, for example, we have some yellow. So these are single LEDs, the, adre the LEDs are addressable. But as you can see, the refresh rate is super slow of these LEDs. Here we have blue, but it doesn't really correspond or it doesn't really match a lot uh, a faster movie. And this is a limitation of the Fnordlicht protocol. It this is how the Fnordlicht packets look like. So these are commands. And uh, Fnordlicht are thought to be devices which you chain one after another. And these devices have RGB values. This is why in the beginning there is this address field. This address will tell which device I want to talk to and if I'm not the device, um, the, the, the command is meant for, I will just forward it to the next device which I'm connected to. So the Fnordi are small devices which you change together. That's why we have this address field. And just after the address field, we have this command field which will say which will say what kind of to command the device has to run. Um, this uh, this can be set to 0f, means all the devices must execute this command. And the messages are always 15 bytes long. The rest of the byte is command specific. So every command has other meetings for these bytes. For example, the first and simplest command is actually the one to start the application. To start the application, you just select which device you want to start. You set, um, you you send this command type 87. That's in hex, and the other bytes you just don't really care because it's just telling please start the please start the program. Now, if we want to send some data, we have to send the 01 command. This stands for set RGB value, set data. And here we can see that we set the RGB values. There are a bit more, um, uh, more fields in there. You can set the steps and the delay. So if you're at one RGB values, you have to go to the next RGB values. You can do that in smaller steps. This is what the steps is here for. And you can set the delay between the steps. The rest of the data, you just don't care. So out of the 15 bytes, you will only use this first seven bytes. Um, and if you have multiple LEDs, so we have 60 LEDs, then you have to send um, 60 times this message with the different address. Now we don't have 16, so in maximum we would have 16 60 LEDs. The problem is that VLC cannot handle these 60 LEDs. So with VLC, we will only be able to address 50 LEDs if you want to respect to respect the aspect ratio. So here, this will go from uh, 0 to 40, 49. And we send the last one just for, uh, and we send the 51st LED just to set, okay, now flush all the values because they will not be flushed at every packet. And the problem is that this protocol comes with a lot of restriction. So the speed is 19,200 bits per second. 
and since this is a 8 and 1 configuration, so 8 bits, no parity bit, one stop bit, you need 9 bits to send one byte. Um, and then for each LED you need 15 bits. This is the message length. So you have 15 bytes per LED. And we have 50 LEDs. So if you sum all this up, if you have 19,200 bits per second divided per 9 for because it's 9 bits per byte divided by 15 because it's 15 bytes per LED divided by 50 at, at actually 51 because we need the last one to flush the data you come to roughly of around 2.8 so this is 2.8 frames per second and uh, we could per second we can send 2.8 times the RGB values to all LEDs. This is pretty lousy and this is quite some huge restriction. Um, the color won't be smooth because of that. This, this Nordic protocol is nice, but it's not meant for this application. So we'll have to use something else. Since the Fnord Lights message format is pretty inefficient because you need 15 bytes to send just one RGB value, um, I decided to implement my own protocol and I thought that the Atmo Light message was pretty simple. It just sends out the RGB values and then you have some kind of small header which is not too big. And this is all I need actually. The rest can be the, how the colors are generated and, and so on can be set by the software itself. So I decided to use the Atmo Light format and what's good is that it is not restricted to 15 bytes and only to four channels. You can send as many channels as you want, you just have to specify it in the lens. So here we have 16 on, of these LEDs. So uh, we have, since each LED, RGB LED needs three values, we have 3 times 60, so 180 bytes we need to send just for the RGB values and this header takes 4 bytes. Also, since I will implement my own protocol, I will make it really fast. Normally the Atmo Light message is sent at this rate, 35,400 bits per second and this is really fast enough for just 15 LEDs. Now we have 16 LEDs, we want to send a lot more data in one second so we can cope with the frame rate. And this is why when, when I will implement my own format based on the Atmo Light, I will not use this default um, board rate, but I will use the farthest standard board rate being uh, 115,200 bits per second. And if you calculate it in the end, if we have 115,200 bits per second and we need 9 bits per byte because we have the 8 and 1 configuration and we need 3 times 60 plus 4 bytes to set all the LED colors we arrive to something like 69 uh, frames per second yeah 69 frames per second. So with this speed, we can have up to 69 frames per second. This is quite good enough for very smooth transition. And I think I will set it to 50 frames per second. So I'm sure that in between messages, we have enough time for the microcontroller to be prepared for the next, next message to arrive. And now I just have to implement this, this extended Atmo Lights message into VLC. So, We've already seen that VLC supports several device types and the classic Atmo Light was just too restricted because it has only four channels, one per side. The Fnor Night was just way too slow for the update rate. So I wanted to combine both of it, being able to talk to a lot of LEDs but in a fast way. So using the Atmo Light protocol but with more than just um, five channels. And since VLC already has some both examples, or at least the uh, Atmo Light example, I wanted to extend it. So let's go to the VLC source code and see 
at um, at the source file to see what we can do and to my surprise I went to the VLC code to the modules video filter this is where the video sh filter should be it is not there there was nothing about at small lights at all in these um, in this file so I found it quite surprising and then I checked a bit further because I was using version 2.2.0 and if you go to the 2.2.0 you see that here there is an Atmolite uh, folder and within this Atmolite folder are all the device types and so on so I was wondering where the hell is it in the master branch I found the corresponding commit and as you can see here all the Atmo video filter have been deleted I was quite surprised why should they delete but it was announced um, by looking at the mailing list you find it that somebody said that this is broken and if nobody wants to fix it it will he will just remove the Atmolite video filter and since nobody complained well now it is the Atmolite filter will not exist anymore in the next VLC release so I've built a device which only works with the current VLC with a have and if I update it then there's no use at all I was a bit sad but um, l by looking around, VLC is not the only one using um, the Atmo light or the screen lights or any kind of ambient lights to show something. And rapidly, I found Bob Light. Bob Light is really simple and it's quite neat. So it's a small software um, which which has two parts, and what it simply does is grab the data from the desktop capture the video player and so on and then you can output it into different um, into different devices and if you look at the configuration file this is exactly what you can do so here is the detail of the configuration file what's important here so let's look at my example configuration is here this is my name it's a screen light since it's the Voodoo screen light. The type is the type of device, and we want to use the Atmolite protocol. So I just put Atmolite on side there. The output is the serial port, again TTY USB 0. The rate is the speed. So even if we load the Atmolite protocol, we don't have to use the standard port rate of 38.5 kilobits per second. We can define rate. And what's even better is that we can define the number of channels we want for this Atmolite. Um, as we've shown previously, there were only uh, four ch five channels, but so 15 bytes, but we want more. So here uh, we have 60 LEDs and each LED has three bytes. This is why we use 180 channels. Here every byte is counted as a channel. And then the interval between the messages is just 200 milliseconds. So we 2 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. So we have a frame rate of 50. Um, then you configure the colors and in the end you configure the light. You configure for each LED which segment of the screen it will take. And here we can see that the top LED uh, with uh, which is LED 19 will take the this part of the screen, horizontal thing, this is this part here of the screen and this should be output to channel 55. So this this should be the red color on the on this device the mask screen light on channel 55 and so on for all the sides so this is really perfect and this is how my screen looks like and this is why i could say that it's number 55 which is i think this one this is number 55 if you multiply it by 3 you come to 55 and uh, this is where uh, where the da data will be and then i just configured for the for the other one. So now that we wrote the configuration file for Bob Light, it is time to test it. And the configuration file just tell where the LEDs are corresponding to my LED, um, LED construction. So for that, I will simply start the Bob Light daemon, so Bob Light D, which will send the data out to the microcontroller and waits input from a socket, a network socket. I think it's UDP, but I'm not sure. And to test if the configuration is approximately right and if all LEDs are addressable, I will use the Bob Light 
constant utility with FF0000 corresponding to red and as we can see on the back of the light, on the back of the screen, it is getting red. If I turn the screen, all the LEDs are red, meaning that the configuration file at least can talk to, LED, uh, can talk to the LEDs. So that's good. But what's even better with Bob Lab D is that this is just a daemon controlling what is displayed on the LEDs and a lot of program can connect to it. Bob Light Constant is just one utility useful to test, but then we have also Bob Light X11 and X11 is the Windows server used in most Linux distributions. So whatever is displayed on your current screen or current Windows would go through X11. So you don't want to have to start a video and something like this, whatever is on the screen will be sent out using Boblet X11 to the Boblet daemon and the Boblet daemon will display it. So let's type Boblet X11. And here, as you can see, I, this is just a picture viewer. So I just put the picture viewer with a white picture. Um, and as we can see, we have white on the background. We can switch to black. We can go to blue. Um, we can go to green, and if we look at the back of the TV, no, the cables are getting short. If we look at the back of the TV, it is green. The next one is the RGB pattern. Um, I think this is even the RGB mix. So, as you can see, the colors correspond to the RGB mix. This is just the red, and this is the simple RGB pattern. So, that works really, really nice. And we can even try it out with a video. So let's start a video. Let's exit this. I need to see what's going on here. And time to open the same sample video we use all the time. And to put it in full screen. And as you can see on the back, the LEDs are flickering corresponding to the, to the image and the frame rate is, is, is quite good actually. So I've set it to 50 frames per second. The LEDs should be capable to handle, and the code should be capable to handling for handling it. And as we see, it works quite well. That's a success. And what's even good with Bob Light is that it works on all Linux, you don't need uh, obligatory VLC. And there is also an XBMC plugin or Kodi plugin. So here I've had Kodi installed uh, using OpenELEC on this Raspberry Pi, the OpenELEC distribution. And I can use my LED strip or my screen light also using now the Raspberry Pi. So we'll start a movie. And as we can see, we have some fading lights. It's not very visible, but it works quite nice. I'll show you the setup. Tac. So here we see the lights. Here I have the Raspberry Pi with the OpenELEC distribution, but the most important thing is that it runs Kodi, previously known as XBMC. This is connected to my LED controller using simply 5 volts to power it on and then serial to send the data. And this is what you see here, 5 volt and serial to power it on. Then it just spits out the data. Here there is, you just have to install the Bob Light D uh, service daemon and then the XPMZ Bob Lights add-on and it works perfectly well. This, and with that, the production finish and now I can watch movies with some really nice ambient lights. And now, it's time to enjoy the nature.